Okay then. Scratch that. Blood and ashes. I'm ridiculously excited we got to see the native way of Times Squares. Other than that, again, I have mixed feelings about the episode. I think I've developed voices. Voices in my head that talk to me while I watch. And I think there are three of them. There may be more, but for now I think there are three. One is the teenage me, the book lover, the part of me that has read the series again and again and again and that obsessed over it for years. Voice number two is the storyteller voice. That's the part of me that wants to understand the creative process behind the show, the part of me that wants to understand why the screenwriters and directors are doing what they're doing and why the writers have done what they've done. And voice number three is the voice of the empathetic reader and viewer, the part of me that wants to be immersed in a story in such a way that I see characters as people, to see events and scenes as life and not as scenes. So those three voices haven't been in agreement lately. I think I'm mainly using the second voice to justify everything the other two voices are whining about. And so far it's working, most of the time. Note number two, I'm currently recording from my childhood bedroom because I'm staying with my mother while she's sick and this does two things. One, I'm staring past the camera right into my bookshelf of Wheel of Time books. And I guess just being here is bringing the teenage super fan to the surface. And the other thing is I'll have to talk quietly because it's the middle of the night here. Healthy sleeping habits. I think now that we are more than halfway through the season, I can afford myself a bit more extensive pre-spoiler review. I think this episode was pretty great in the sense that it allowed us to stay with the characters, to get a better feel of them and their relationships, and that allows some of the actors to really shine. We get an opening scene with the Aes Sedai and the funeral arrangements they're making, and then after the opening credits we jump ahead one month and many, many miles of road ahead. And we see that nothing has changed. The soundtrack and the mood is the same. And I think that foreshadows the way the whole episode is gonna go. I like the idea of them using a riderless horse to show Karina's absence and how her absence stayed with them throughout the whole journey. If you haven't noticed it anywhere else, a riderless horse is a horse carrying a dead man's boots reversed in the stirrups. And it's usually a military thing, so I think it fits Karin pretty nicely as the battle adder. I think the episode does a great job developing the relationships between Lan and Moraine, Rand and Matt, Rand and Nynaeve, and Nynaeve and the Green. There's a point to it all, and though some of the stories are told with different conclusions drawn out of them as compared to the books, I still like that we get to see them. There's also a chance given for a relationship to form between Moraine and Nynaeve, other than headbutting and distrust, and I'm all for that. I think it makes the relationships more complex. This episode also shows us our first look of Loyao in action. It's a brief introduction, but it's sweet, and Loyao is nothing if not sweet. I think there was quite a lot of fuss regarding the costume, but I think on the whole the way the part is written and the way the actor portrays it really does the character justice. There is this very nice mix of curiosity and eagerness as he tries to engage Rand and also the unhurried, deliberate pace of his actions and his talk. I think it's pretty nice. The hair is distracting. 
but on the whole, I quite like it. And it's the only source of lightheartedness in the whole hour of screen time. We see a bit of color and liveliness from Tarvalon and its markets, and just a little bit from Meguin as she skips into view to join Perrin and Aaron. But I think it doesn't alter the mood much, and if it does, it's not for long. Overall, the pace of the episode is slow, sullen, heavy with emotion and the unmade decisions. And I think it allows us to feel the gravity of what's happening and to feel the uncertainty that's building up. If you're not into drama, it might feel like it's dragging, but it's also over before you know it. We see the tortured characters show bits and pieces of humor, but it's all dark and it's darkened by the context. There are also answers to some questions and objections after the first episodes. Um, I think that's good. It makes me trust the creators even more. Like me personally, I was wondering after the first episode about the attention that's placed on the SDI hands and the gestures they need for channeling and why the white cloaks cut the hands of the one they had captured off. So now here we see Valda's answer and it fits the lore from the books. So that nicely wraps it up. For me personally, I think there are bits and pieces of rituals and relationships that got repeated and prolonged the tension that probably could have been cut so that the screen time could be used for other situations that I felt could have used a little bit more screen time. I would have easily scrapped the marching band shots from Logan's procession, for instance. But on the whole, I think it's a painful episode that lays crucial groundwork for episodes to come. All right, I tried. I tried to do the scene by scene talk like last week, but it didn't work. What happened was, I went, yeah, here we see the Aesidae traveling slowly, or in the words of Chaucer slash Paul Bettany, trudging. And feeling gloomy and exhausted. And now here are Rand and Matt, walking slowly and feeling gloomy and exhausted. And here is Perrin talking to Aram, walking slowly and feeling, guess what? Gloomy and exhausted. That's the overall mood of the whole bloody episode, trudging. People who are walking slowly with nothing left but the impulse to simply soldier on and we assume there's hope in some of them, that if they keep walking, they'll get to a better place. But we don't really see much of that. Still, more spoilery thoughts from here on now. The funeral part, I think, includes some decisions that have been made so that everything is clearly visible and visually effective, like placing a helmet on a warrior's chest and Stepin's farewell, I think. Otherwise, who digs extremely shallow graves in perfect circles? I'd like to imagine off-screen a Nes die standing in the middle and digging them with solemn precision and then covering them and sealing them with the power. Otherwise, it makes very little sense. Unless you are the man behind the camera who says, yeah, but I want to see him take the ring off her finger and then I want to see him stay with her until the very last moment. And then I want a very cool bird's eye view of the whole thing that I will later edit next to a dance sequence in the trailer so it looks very dramatic. Skip forward to Rand and Matt. I think I've gone entirely biased regarding Matt because I loved every bit of his performance in the fourth episode. And here, even though we don't see that much of him, everything feels 
absolutely so spot on. From snapping at anything even vaguely resembling a threat and anyone trying to get close, his distrust of everything, including food, with the notable exception of Rand, and how tortured he is and how his own memories are plagued with uncertainty since he himself doesn't know what happened in the farm from the previous episode. And then his characteristic total disregard of authority and people telling him what he should be doing in the scene where he makes a pact with Rand what's gonna happen if one of them turns out to be the channeler. It's all awesome. I mean, most of it is horrible, but awesomely done. I love the way the scene with Loghain laughing at the boys is executed. I think for book readers everywhere by now it's fairly obvious that they are pointedly ignoring Rand in terms of who the Dragon Reborn could be. By now we have established that both Egwene and Nynaeve can channel and that there is something wrong or special about Matt and Perrin both. But at the same time, Rand is still the same boy that left Emmons Field, flying totally under the radar. And I think this scene with Logan is another perfect example of this misdirection, because as we see Logan laughing and the shot turns back to the boys, it pointedly is centered on Matt and Rand is at the side almost cut out. And while Matt, with his own doubts, is staring back at Loghain, Rand is looking worriedly at Matt. So, nicely done. Perrin and his note towards the Tinkers and their pets is something that ticked me off, but that's for personal reasons. I imagine in his state of mind, anything relating to violence sticks out to him. But here's the thing. I don't eat much meat myself, but I'm not decidedly vegan or vegetarian, but I have also no issues with anyone who is. The only issue I've ever had is if anyone who is vegan or vegetarian tries to force their dietary decisions on anyone else, especially if that's someone of an entirely different species, who has relied on meat for millions of years before that. I have had a friend who was vegan and made their dogs vegan, and that's not something I can easily agree with. So no, I don't think it's hypocritical for anyone who tries to lead violence-free life to allow their dogs to hunt especially in a world where pet shops and meat substitutes don't exist. But let's leave my personal feelings aside for now. The rest of Perrin and Teguin's arc is very much in sync with who they are. Scared kids in a scary world that turned out way scarier than the one they grew up in. One is stubborn and mouthy, the other one is racked with guilt and fear of himself, but both are kind and caring and self-sacrificing. The white cloaks and their purification and torture make me so utterly uncomfortable I might develop a tick from cringing, so I'd say that's very well done. There is nothing too original in terms of interrogation and torture, but it, it works. It struck me as a bit early in the series for us to see one of them shed their mask and admit that as much as they like to talk about walking in the light, that's no guarantee they follow their oaths. It's a scare and manipulation tactic and it works. But still, I thought they'd maintain the facade a bit longer. The build-up of Wolf House in the background is very nice touch, and the green grabbing the ass bearings as she leaves as well. 
I'm not sure about this, but I think maybe their escape would have made a better ending to the episode, but that's probably because part of me rebels against the prolonged suffering of Stepin and the expansion of his character before his eventual death. But that's because, to me, he feels a bit like Perrin's wife, a less important character who is introduced mainly to make a point necessary for someone else's arc. But on the other hand, it's a nice frame for the episode, we start with a funeral and we end with one. I'm not sure exactly what they say about it in the books, but in my head, most warders, it made sense that after Darius die, dies, assuming they don't die in revenge immediately, would do something similar to what Lan would do. They would go on some kind of suicide mission against the Blight. And it especially made sense to me for the Green Agile Warders. But I'm aware that's not a story easy to tell for screen, so I've made my peace with that. On the whole, I think Stepan's story is mainly a way to show more of the human side of Lan and Moraine, and we see them thinking about their own mortality and the impact on the other and building on their relationship. My personal favorite from the scenes between them is after Stepin melts the ring and we see Lan immediately going to Moraine and kneeling silently beside her and holding her ring hand. It's a beautiful scene as well as the one during Stepan's funeral where we see Moraine's bond-enhanced empathetic participation and it's great acting both from Rosamund Pike and Daniel Haney who managed to portray so much by talking so little. But we do get a lot of those scenes in this episode. <laughs> I like the fact that we see this side of Moraine. It makes her character more human and more complex than the books show her at first. On the other hand, for better or for worse, it makes her less calculating and manipulative and she seems a lot more justified in what she does, especially in transferring the bond later on. And on that subject, I'm not sure if they don't plan to meld Alana and Mirele because of the conversation Alana and Moraine had about the bond. But that's just a suspicion. And I think it would complicate things, but I guess we'll see. And some random bits and pieces I liked during the episode, starting with the negative so I can end on a positive note. I didn't like when Lan and Stepin were discussing Stepin's possible bonding with Alana, that they were talking about it as if it meant necessarily joining Alana and her warders in their threesome sexually, which maintains the notion, the suggestion during the series that the warders and their Sedai are usually intimate. I love the chemistry Lan and Moraine have, uh, and I love the companionship, but none of it feels sexual to me. And I don't think that's just because I know the story and not because they are just more reserved as people. I didn't like Maxim's joke about his father trying to kill him when he was five and so Stepan should stop whining. I get that it's a flimsy attempt to lighten the mood and it's true to life because a lot of us do this. We turn to our own experience, especially when we are under pressure to change the subject. But the fact that someone has dealt with something at some point in the past means very little to someone who's dealing with their own thing currently. Advice and experience can be very useful, but things like, hey man, why is your finger bleeding? You cut it five seconds ago. I had my arm chopped off a year ago and I'm fine. That's not so useful. Uh, 
I like the way the scene after Lan wakes up was executed. I loved the use of sound or lack thereof. It felt real, the rush, the chaos, the being deaf to anything else. I didn't like how the warder commander singled out Lan during Stepan's funeral. It felt to me like placing a responsibility on him, which is not something anyone in that position needs. Of course, when someone you're close to is not doing well, especially after suicide, you feel like you haven't done enough. So putting him on the spot like that felt unfair, unkind, maybe even cruel. I liked Nynaeve crossing her arms after Maureen asked Lant to leave during their conversation. It's an obvious defensive gesture and it shows she felt safer with him around. I like the casual glimpses of the carved stones that both Yaya Sedai and Rand and Matt pass by. I like the one the Yaya Sedai passed by better, it felt more authentically weathered. But I do wonder why there are two sets of them next to Tarvalon. I like the serendipitous way in which Loyal stumbles into Nynaeve and decides to bring her to Rand. I think it's a nice job of introducing the Tavirian effect, though no one has pointed it out yet. So yeah, it wasn't fun, it wasn't dynamic, but I think it was mostly good. Knowing how little time we have left in the season makes me greedy to use some of the time devoted to Stepan and the elaborate funeral rites for anything else. But oh well. Let me know what you think in the comments. I'm loving rejoining the Wheel of Time community lately and I don't know about you, but for me it's nice to be able to talk about A.S. Sedai at a time when the general public is starting to know what that means. <laughs>